good afternoon, you Googleites, and everybody else out there in the world. Thanks for joining me for lunch. I don't know what you're having. I'm having sugarless gum, actually, for lunch today. But it's not unusual. I come from a family where my wife never leaves the couch for any reason. And um, she is on a new diet, and this is how I'm going to make my true fortune. I'm going to write a diet book. I, by the way, I could be the after her. Okay? <laughs> um, it works for her. She's been out for two years. It's the all-you-can-eat meat and all-you-can-drink wine diet. And um, she's up to about a herd a week. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, maybe maybe a visit to the Betty Ford Clinic eventually. But at this point, she is as slim and sweet as the girl I first married. And I should point out that I am the only writer in history only to have one wife. But that's okay. She helps me with my research. So that um, whenever I'm researching a book, um, she gets deeply involved with all of the same materials that I do, and she gets very passionate about it. And then, of course, I have to write the book for the next year, and she forgets entirely about it. She was most helpful to me when I did my book, The Inner Circle, which came out in 2004. This is about Alfred C. Kinsey, who invented sex. And um, she went with to Bloomington, Indiana with me, and we went to the Kinsey Institute, and we, you know, we studied all the various arcane sexual things he's got there. And then, of course, she helped me with the research. She's continuing to help me with the research for that one. Um, and she also helped me with the research for the current book, which is what brings me here when the killing's done. Um, as long as I'm talking about her. She has a mother, my wife, my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law has always been a little bit hor horrified by me, as if you know I'm some kind of crazy beast. But when you can see that I'm not, I'm just the most sweet guy in the world. So that for the first 20 years, for instance, she'd be visiting us, sitting, uh, I'd be, uh, she'd be sitting in the kitchen, I'd come down for breakfast, and she'd jump up from the chair and say, my God, does he sit here? I'd say, no, it's okay, it's all right, she can sit there. Now we've come to a little bit of a rapprochement, uh, and it works this way. She lives in Arizona, and I will never in the rest of my life ever go to Arizona for any reason, and um, uh, she only comes and visit when I'm away. It's great, it's perfect. However, when I do see her, she says, you are so lucky. And in fact, I am lucky because whenever I want to discover something, I just write a book about it. That's the way my brain works. I write fiction. I only write fiction. That's all I do. And so, um, 18 years ago, I made my escape from L.A. and moved to Santa Barbara. Uh, I still, though, teach one day a week at USC. I'm the first writer they ever had there. I started the undergrad writing program. I love it. It's great. It's a great thing. But it's 100 miles each way. Um, by the way, I have a red sports car. If you see red is my color. See that? Um, and I don't enjoy it in the slightest bit. It's only a tool, like a screwdriver, for instance. And the tool enables me to get between the blind, deaf, semi-retarded, drunken, woman in the Mercedes Benz texting in the fast lane doing 40 miles an hour and the trucker right here. There's usually a gap about this big. And this little sports car, when you hit the gas to the floor, it's just like in Star Wars. Boom! And you see them fading in the mirror. <laughs> so, this is my life. And all these years of going up the coast highway, I always go through Malibu and up the coast highway looking at the ocean instead of through the valley. Um, I've seen the Channel Islands sitting off the coast, wondering what goes on out there. Now I know. Um, as you may know, the Channel Islands is a national park now, but these islands were originally uh, owned by individuals for many, many years, and they used them for sheep ranching. So that the big Dunn Island sitting off of Santa Barbara, 22 miles off the coast, is Santa Cruz Island. It's four times bigger than Manhattan. Nobody lives there. Um, as recently as the late 80s, it was owned, 90% of it was owned by a very wealthy guy who was the son of an oil trillionaire, and uh, his name was Gary Stanton. He owned this island. Uh, there's a main ranch, and there, and there were some outlying ranches, and this was used for sheep. I think they would you know, sell the wool, and they would sell lambs, and so on. Gary Stanton, on his death, ceded it to the Nature Conservancy, 90% of the island. The other 10% is National Park right now. This was owned by a different family. But it's all now trying to be restored. And what I've written about in 
when the killing's done, is this restoration process. Um, it began in 2001 on Anacapa Island. And what I'm going to tell you now is my fiction, what I've done, is dramatize actual events. So all of what I'm going to tell you actually happened. So in 2001, the Park Service decided to bomb Anacapa Island with rat poison. Brotofacum, the same stuff that if, you know, anybody listening or out there has had a heart attack, that's the stuff the doctor's giving you. And it's the same stuff in decon that you put in your traps. Um, the rats had gotten to Anacapa in 1853 with the wreck of the Winfield Scott. This is a paddle wheel steamer coming out of San Francisco with a bunch of passengers who would eventually go to the East Coast, to New York. A lot of them were 49ers who'd been out in the back country and had their gold and they were and made their fortune and they were on their way back home. The boat would go to Panama, there was no Panama Canal yet, and they'd trek across and take another steamer up the East Coast. Well, they didn't make it. <laughs> they didn't make it on this particular occasion because the boat, in a tremendous fog, went aground on Anacapa Island. Uh, no one died. Uh, everyone was rescued after a couple of days, of course. They did have to um, forage for food. One guy shot a seal. Uh, can you imagine what seals taste like? Um, they were rescued. The gold was rescued. Everything was great. But the ship went down, and all the rats got ashore. And now, 150 years later, 2001, uh, the Park Service decided to remove the rats. Why? Well, because uh, the ground nesting birds there had evolved in the absence of predators, and the rats were decimating their numbers. Even after all this time, uh, they were eating their eggs and killing the nestlings. All right, so the Park Service decided to go out in November 2001 and with helicopters and drop rat poison all over the island. Um, and they said there'd be no collateral damage. The native white-footed mouse, they captured a bunch of them and they were breeding them, you know, separately. The birds are not going to eat it because it's bright blue. If you know decon pellets, it's bright blue. Uh, however, there were some protests. And in actual fact, there was a guy called the Rat Savior. And he protested this and went out with a confederate to Anacapa when this was underway with huge backpacks full of kibble and vitamin K, because vitamin K is the antidote to brofacum. <laughs> and I've, I've created a character based on this guy, whom I've never met. I just read about this in the newspaper. And my character is named Dave LaJoy, and he's one of the two antagonists of this novel. He's 42 years old in 2001. He wears his hair in dreadlocks. He's a pretty cool guy, at least in his own mind. Um, and he's made his money with uh, four uh, stores that he owns that sell um, uh, stereo and, and audio and, uh, and audiovisual equipment. And uh, he is a very, very, very angry guy. One of these people who's angry about everything. But his one defining subject is animal rights. And he feels that no animal should be killed for any reason. He's opposed, meanwhile, to a character I've created called Alma Boyd Takasue. And she he works for the Park Service, and she's in charge of this operation to remove the rats, and later to remove other feral animals on Santa Cruz Island, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and she is just like him. I mean, they both love animals, they love the environment, they want to preserve everything. But she is intransigent. There can't be any killing of anything, even a rat. But she indulges in real politic. She feels that certain invasive species can be removed, must be removed, in order to preserve the much rarer species that will go extinct if they're not removed. And so that forms the basis of all of what goes on in this book. Um, in actual life and in my novel, and we'll call him, we, we, we ignore the real guy, the actual guy, we're going to just talk about Dave LaJoy. Um, he was arrested with his confederate for feeding wildlife in a national park without a permit. <laughs> and um, um, his, uh, by the way, his buddy copped to it and got, you know, a $150 fine or something. Because they're both dressed in black with hoodies and black baseball caps. And they were seen by a park ranger on a capo. They were the only people there that day. Um, but in a court of law, it couldn't be proven that he had, which one he saw throwing the stuff, because they were both dressed exactly alike. So Dave LaJoy got off on this count. Then, and by the way, I mean this all sounds so theoretical. 
And believe me, in my telling, it is full of filth, horror, various <laughs> degrees of slime and misery and, and antagonism. And you, know, and you also learn about island biogeography. Uh, in fact, my favorite um, review of this book said that this is the first island biogeographical thriller. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm so happy, but I'm sure there'll never be a second one, you know? <laughs> Um, before I tell you the rest of the story, maybe I will give you a very brief reading of Dave LaJoy. He's very, very, very angry at all times. And in this tiny little passage I'm going to give you, it takes place the day after Dave has interrupted Alma's meeting. Uh, she, uh, by the way, uh, uh, I've read that in, in America, uh, people's greatest fear is not of spiders bigger than your hand, or Islamic terrorists, or brain cancer. It is of speaking before a large group in public. And Alma has to do this. And you see the previous chapter from her point of view. She's explaining to people at the Natural History Museum, with concerned citizens, what this is all about. And Dave has come to interrupt and jeer at her. And in fact, when she leaves the meeting, after he's been ejected, her car has spray painted across it, Die Gook Bitch. Now, we don't know who spray painted that, but we have our suspicions. And so, the next day, I'll just give you a very brief account of Dave. He's having breakfast the next day, and he's looking in the newspaper to see what account they gave of his interrupting this meeting. Um, can I use some um, language here that I couldn't use on NPR uh, by any chance? Is Let's that put a warning on the video. Yeah. We can put a warning on the video. I'm pretty so, good at it. I mean, I could, I could substitute you're here um, because you know terms like crap for shit, but it's not as good well, because this yeah. is the, the way just Dave on. just <laughs> does it, you know? So I'm going to give you just a little bit of language. This is Dave just having breakfast. Very angry guy. If there's one thing he hates, it's a runny yolk. And toast so dry it shatters like a cracker before you can spread the butter. And rain. He hates the rain, too. Three days of it now, making a mess of the streets and keeping shoppers out of the stores. Pathetic numbers. Absolutely pathetic in all four units. And with the Christmas season coming on, no less. Depressing people, drooling like bilge down the plate glass window at the Cactus Cafe, where he eats breakfast five days a week, and they still can't figure out what over-fucking-easy means. His dried-out toast is cold. The coffee tastes like aluminum foil, and it's cold, too. Or lukewarm at best. And the newspaper has one stingy little article about what went down at the museum last night, tucked away in the community events roundup for Tuesday, November 20, 2001, the date in bolder type than the headline, as if to indicate how mind-numbing and inconsequential everything had been as it had been the day before and the day before that. Under the headline, protest at museum lecture, there's a scant two paragraphs that don't begin to get at the issue. And worse, don't even mention him or FPA by name, let alone set out the counter-arguments he'd thrown right in the face of that condescending little bitch from the Park Service who was fooling nobody with her gray-eyed squint and her all-black outfit as if she were going to a funeral or a goth club or something, and all her tricked-up images of the cute little animals that just have to be saved in the face of this sudden onslaught by all these other ugly little animals made uglier by somebody's Photoshop manipulations as if the birds wouldn't last another week when 150 years had gone by complete <coughs> harmony and natural balance with all the other birds and plants and the rats too, something Alma Boyd Takasui, Ph.D., didn't bother to mention. Suddenly, he's jerking his head around, and there's Marta, fat Marta with her two-tongued tits and big pregnant belly that isn't pregnant at all, only just fat, bending over some other guy's table by the door, flirting with him, for Christ's sake. And before he can think, he shouts out her name, surprising himself by the violence of his voice. Everybody in the place, and there must be 30 of them, half he recognizes and half not, looks up in unison as if they were all named Marta. And what does he think about that? He thinks, fuck you, collectively. He thinks he might have to find another goddamn diner where they know the difference between, and here she is, her face drawn down around a mouth, shrunk to the size of a keyhole beneath the flabby cheeks, coming to him as swiftly as her two small feet can carry her, trying to act as if she cares. Is everything okay, she asks, before she's halfway to him, so everybody can hear her doing her job, even Francisco, the cook, who's giving him a hooded look from behind the grill, a cigarette in one hand, a spatula in the other. No, he says, still too loud. 
And they're still looking, all of them, because they're a bunch of sad-ass, pathetic voyeurs with nothing better to do, and fuck them, really, fuck them. No, everything isn't okay. Because I come here, in here every day, don't I? And you people still don't know what over easy means? Shit, if I wanted sunny side up, if I wanted to run a yoke, that's what I would have ordered. She's already reaching for the plate, already apologizing. Sorry, Sarah, I'll have the cook. And all the rest of the mollifying, meaningless little phrases she dispenses a hundred times a day because the cook's a moron, and to call her incompetent would be a compliment. But he can't help saying, snarling, and why is he snarling? Take it away and do it right, or don't do it at all. And to the retreating twin hummocks of her butt. And the toast is like that shit they give babies. What do you call it? Zwieback? And I don't want Zwieback. I want toast. She's at the swinging door to the kitchen now, making a show of upending the plate in the trash while Francisco shrinks into the Aztec and nullity of his face. And everybody else in the place pretends to take up their conversations where they left off. And he can't help adding, his voice lower now, the rage all steamed out of him, though the heat's still up high. Simple toast. Is that too much to ask? So, that is your introduction to Dave from his point of view. And of course, what novelists love to do is have opposing points of view. And you get deep into each of the antagonists and how they feel. And Dave, he's not a nice guy. He's a bore. He's a bully. He's angry. But he does have a good point. He is against the killing of anything. Alma, on the <coughs> side, is rational, but she's also very intransigent and a little uptight and a little stiff. And maybe neither one of them is exactly the most wonderful person in the world. But, I mean, aside from present company, nobody else is either, right? Um, one further little note about Dave. You might hear some of this tonight when you come to the exam. It's all right? Yeah. Yeah, because it's a shtick. <laughs> I'm not uh, saying anything. So. All right, thanks. Well, you can whisper into your mother's ear. Is it your mother or what's no, your wife? Your wife. You whisper into your ear. What's <laughs> going to happen? Same. If you remember when you're, you're like nine years old, you love the movie, and then you saw it the second time with your best friend, and just before something happens, you whisper to them. I'll do that. You can do that. Okay. So one more this thing about the. This, huh? this is the good part. Oh, we're going to get okay. some good okay. stuff. Oh, no, there's plenty, plenty. And I'll, I'll I'll shift it for tonight's performance a bit, so you don't have to be too bored. <laughs> Wow. That reminds me, by the way, I've, I've already made fun of my wife a little bit. Now I have to tell you about the true love of my wife. Um, sometimes she'll go with me on tour. She's, she's done it a million times. Like maybe in, in Germany, she'll go in Germany or something. And she'll hear pretty much the same show every night, night after night. And I'll look out into the audience and see her with her head thrown back, howling with laughter. <laughs> you know? That's love. That's real love. Uh, anyway, Dave, Dave doesn't have a whole lot of love. and. Um, Here's one other thing he does. Um, before all of this takes place, Alma had just moved to town. He just got, just got the job with the Park Service. And she lived in a little part of Santa Barbara, which is a little village. And she knew everybody in the village. She began to get acquainted with them. And she had a favorite restaurant, a very nice upscale Italian place. She'd often go there alone or with girlfriends. And she felt comfortable there. She knew the owner, the Metro D. And so, before any of this happened, she happened to be in a cafe listening to a folk singer and met Dave. He's a good looking guy. They were both in their 30s at that point. And he and she struck up a conversation. They're both environmentalists, you know, they love nature. And so, he asked her on a date. But she doesn't know who he is, so she said, yeah, sure, but, you know, I'd feel comfortable if we could go to the restaurant, my restaurant in my village. No problem. So, they go on the date. And they come. And Dave, you know, you've, you've just heard him. He's a little bit, a little bit out there. Um, he orders the most expensive bottle of wine on the list. It's three hundred twenty dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he is already getting out of, getting crazy because there's no sommelier, just the waiter. Where's the sommelier? You don't have a sommelier, hey, Jesus. So he then demands that the owner come over. So the owner comes over personally and opens a bottle of wine for Dave. And Dave goes through the ritual. He sniffs the cork, you know, the swirling in the glass, the little taste, and so on. Spits it right out, says it's rot gut, get it out of here. All right? So then he orders the second most expensive bottle of wine on the list, and the same scenario takes place, at which point Alma gets up and leaves. So that was their first meeting. That was their first date. And uh, speaking of love, by the way, um, 
the truest test of love, if you're a writer like me, of your friends, of your wide uh, circle of friends, is this. That story that I just told you actually happened while I was writing this novel to a friend of mine who lives here in the Bay Area. She's a lawyer. She just moved into one of the little towns on the Bay. And she met a guy on the internet who claimed also to be a lawyer. Well, and, and, and a tall lawyer for that matter. But actually he was a short non lawyer. But what the hell? They went on a date and to her uh, restaurant and the whole same played out just as I've told you. Um, they're happily married now. Three children. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> it was a one-time deal, you know. I just um, want to let you know the wine was bad. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, don't forget. <laughs> don't forget. The owner, of course, is going to taste this wine in the back. To, to know. Um, wow. So anyway, um, my friends all know that when they reveal anything to me. They know that their deepest sexual secrets will be revealed to the public for my profit eventually. And that is the test of love and friendship beyond any I can imagine. All right, so let me just tell you a little bit more about the continuing story. The first third of the book is the Anacapa story, which I just told you about. And that sets up the big fight to come. And um, again, this is what attracted me to this story. It seems utterly absurd when you have a closed ecosystem and you add or remove something that's invasive, you don't know what the effects will be. And biologists call it a cascading effect, where one thing leads to something you couldn't even imagine. So, briefly, just after World War II, Monsanto Chemical Company dumped DDT into the Santa Monica Bay. The result was, this worked its way up the food chain. You've all read your Rachel, Rachel Carson in Silent Spring. And the bald eagles, which and having all the islands were exterminated. Their eggs would no longer hatch, they died off. They are more territorial and tougher than the golden eagle. They are pacivorous, they mainly eat fish. The golden eagle eats ground animals. And so, in the absence of the moles, the goldens moved in. Why? Because it was a good food source for them. Delicious, fat, creamy, bright little piglets. The pigs, how the pigs got there? Well, the original sheep ranchers had some pigs, and the pigs got loose. Now, under 50 years later, they were feral. Wild boars all over the island. Wouldn't be so bad, except that, except for the sheep. The sheep um, had to be removed because once it became Nature Conservancy and National Park Service, the sheep were changing the ecology. As you know, sheep eat everything right down to the root. So there were no longer any uh, young trees or saplings. All we had was elderly trees, which would die. Trees are very important on the ridge line because they trap the moisture from the fog, which gives the island, which is rather dry, some of its moisture. So it's changing the ecology. All right, so the first thing is they removed all the sheep. Not a big deal because the sheep had gone back and forth anyway. You know? They could be trapped and sent back to the mainland. Um, I'm sure a lot of them became lamb chops, but you know, this is the way life is. Um, however, this could not happen with the pigs. They were a discreet population. They'd been there 450 years, and the fear was they might have developed peculiar diseases that would, could be communicated back ashore to other pigs and you know, would decimate the, their pork industry throughout America. So they had to be killed in situ. So what happened was, in real life and in my telling, um, Nature Conservancy and the Park Service got together and they hired a group of New Zealand guys who specialize in exterminating animals on islands. And the New Zealand and the Aussies know a lot about this for obvious reasons. And um, at a mere cost of $7 million, they came in, fenced off the island progressively, killed all the pigs. They shot them dead and just left them there to rot. Uh, 5,500 of them, as it turns out. Why did this have to be done? Well, because of the invasive fennel. I mean, I mean, this sounds like something Samuel Beckett would have come up with from for a play. The invasive fennel. Once the sheep were removed, the fennel, you know, uh, anise, the seeds you know, you use in sausages and so on, this grew up into enormous thickets, the size of this room, 20 feet high. And the delicious piglets hid in the thickets, and the goldens had nothing to eat. What are they going to eat? Now we get to the poster animal of all of this. The dwarf island fox, which is four to six pounds, the size of a small cat, 
through the principles of island biogeography, which will either make an animal larger or smaller depending on its availability of food resources and its niche. This animal has been there 16,000 years, um, and it has become a dwarf variety. It's very rare, and suddenly they were disappearing, and no one knew exactly why. Well, one of the biologists, Lotus Vermeer, who runs the Nature Conservancy project there, showed me on her computer screen a golden eagle chick that they photographed. We love it. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just big. It's got claws. It's a golden eagle. We love golden eagles. But beneath it were the remains of 20 of these foxes, one of which had a radio collar on it, which is how they discovered the problem. All right. So they had to take all the remaining foxes have to breed them because they'd be gone. This all happened within the last five or six years. They'd be gone. They'd be extinct now. And so in came the biologists to trap the goldens, which is not easy. This is a big animal flying. They, they, they threw nets out of helicopters, but then, you know, when it, it falls. And they managed to trap them without harming them and take them to the Sierras and let them go. Meanwhile, they brought in bald eagles from Alaska to repopulate the islands. Um, and it's working because I was there with my wife for the release of the first two bald eagle chicks born on that island since the 40s. And again, the chick is like this. And uh, right now they have let the foxes go. And it seems that they have been able to restore this ecosystem. But of course, the question is, this book poses, and I should read you the epigraph, is who has the right to do all of this? Um, how do we get to be the ones to decide? Yes, we're the biggest animal, we're the toughest, we're the smartest. We eat them, we use them for our pleasure. But, you know, look at the rat. You know, uh, what about the white rat, you know, that, that, that my kids had, you know, living in a cage in a privileged position while behind the walls are their feral cousins crapping uh, screwing and dying every night. And, uh, you know, one one is, is a beloved and the other is a nuisance. So the book has an epigraph from Genesis 1.28, and it sort of sets up the thematic elements of the book for me. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So I start from that proposition and try to examine this. Can't make a story out of it. This is simply the way, for better or worse, my brain works. I can't really do deep thinking unless I'm actually writing something. Um, people see me on the street, you know, and they think, oh, there he goes. He's probably thinking deep thoughts and, you know, coming up with his next novel. No, I'm just like all the rest of you. When I'm walking down the street, I'm thinking, kill, screw, eat. Kill, screw, <laughs> eat, exclusively. You know? I can only think about issues like this when I'm in the middle of some complex story, and I never have an outline. I don't know what it's going to be. It just evolves organically as I go on day by day over the course of a year. And I think all these artistic <coughs> uh, uh, questions and structural questions and thematic questions resolve themselves um, on an unconscious level. So all of that said, um, and we have, uh, we have some time left. I mean, I could read the entire novel to you except for the last paragraph, or, um, or we could do questions. And I could save this wonderful story for people who might be going to the gig tonight oh, no, to have something sure, sure, fresh stay with these and people. beautiful. Sure, sure. Really? People, yeah. Really? Yeah. Hmm. How much time? Do, do, do we have uh, 20 minutes more? Do you want to ask questions? I mean, how are we going to do this? It's up to you. Five 20 minutes, and, uh, the story that you're going to tell, certainly that will leave time for questions. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. The story is 400 pages long. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, do we have to exactly have an hour? Or can we run over? Well, there's can we a, be shorter? another meeting coming in at one. Oh, another I'm meeting. Sorry. By the way, another remember I told you how lucky I am? Yes, I'm a professor, but I don't go to meetings. I can't bear meetings. I can't. I'm sorry, I don't care what anybody else says. I don't want to hear them. I don't want their opinion. I'm not a team player. I never will be. I'm sorry. So I feel lucky. I don't have to go to meetings. It's but my team. Lot, like the meetings I go to. Is it? Yeah. Really? Everybody feels the same way. I think instead of reading you another story, um, I just want to talk to you and take your questions. How's that? 
Um, but I know there are a lot of engineers in the room. Please, no math questions. <laughs> Throw it out. Come on. Give me some, any, anything you want to know about uh, with regard to this or the, the dwarf foxes. So you're speaking to, sorry, no, um, you were speaking to uh, your method for writing uh, novels. How is that different in terms of thought processes for the short stories you write? Is it just sort of an inkling of an idea and you just develop that? When you write, when you come up with an idea, how do you say that, oh, this is a short story versus something I'm going to go more further into? I can see that we're not, yeah, I can see we're not all engineers in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Writers. Yeah, we, for these poor guys way over here. Where are these guys anyway? I think it's at Santa Monica. Santa Monica, okay. Yeah. Wow. So you know all about the DDT in the Bay. You're probably drinking it in that cup of water. <laughs> uh, the question was, uh, is there, do I have a difference between uh, uh, novels and short stories when I'm developing ideas? Yes. Um, yes, they're very discreet. Uh, I've never had um, a short story get larger and become a novel, or vice versa, a novel become progressed to a story. I'm uh, very single-minded, and I work in periods and I, I will write a novel, then I'll write maybe half a book of stories because, you know, your ideas peter out, then I'll write another novel and the other half a book of stories, and on and on and on. Um, and incidentally, the joy of writing a novel, which is what I was doing before they dragged me off on this tour three weeks ago, um, is that you know what you're going to do tomorrow. You know? The problem is anything that you might tell me or I might learn or read about or anything that happens in society, I can't really use I have to put it aside because I'm locked into some other novel altogether. And sometimes it might be an historical novel even. Um, the joy of the short story is anything that you want to address, you can address. Uh, and over a period of six or eight months or however long I might be writing stories. The downside is, in between stories, you are bereft. You have nothing to do. You're completely nuts. Um, you realize that you're doomed, you're a failure, uh, you've never written anything before, you'll never write anything again, um, uh, you're over the hill, uh, and you only think about a suicide for the first week, and then maybe a glimmer of a story comes and you start with a sentence. I always see something and then I start with a little sentence and then I try to follow that. I might, the first couple of days I might just get one paragraph done. Once you get into the flow and your, um, your unconscious mind takes over, then the story reveals itself, you find the ending, that might take another two weeks, then you have the dead week at the end where you're trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life. And this is of course why all writers are drug addicts and alcoholics and why they beat their wives, their children and their dogs. Except for me. I'm an exception. Yes? Yeah, um, you were talking about, you know, an idea intrigues you and then you sort of process it by writing a novel about it. So, for instance, this story about this island, um, there's a lot of parts, and there's, I guess there's conflict sort of inherent in it, but there's not necessarily a story like a, with a complete arc. How do you construct the story arc out of you know, all these different parts? Mm -hmm. Another nine is here. Great. The question uh, for you guys in Santa Monica is about, uh, there's a lot of disparate elements in here. How do I construct a, st a narrative out of the whole thing? I don't know. I don't know. It's everybody has some kind of gift, and this is my gift. I don't know how I do it. Um, there's a deep structure that has to reveal itself. Uh, an example of, of another way of working. Um, I was going off on tour a couple of years ago, and forgive me, my entire life is book tours. That's all I know about. And um, I just met with a grad class uh, the week before. I just met two of the students, and they came in just to chat with me to get acquainted, and each said, yeah, I'm writing a novel. Uh, but I'm having trouble. I said, well, okay, great, you know, we'll, we'll work on that. How far along are you? They said, like, 300 pages. I said, great, wonderful. But they're not connected pages. You know, they've written the kitchen scene because they love the kitchen scene, but it's sitting there to be stuck in somewhere. I don't think it's supposed to work that way. I think it has to be organic, as I've said. It has to evolve as you go along and discover what it is. So, um, this is the way I work. It's the only way I know how to work. Yeah. Um, speaking of structure, one of my favorite novels of yours is The Women. Um, and that I found the structure fascinating because you end with Mema's story. Um, and that's actually really quite early on in Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, life. How did you, 
I mean, I have my own theories on why you ended with Mamus' story, because he just goes on to do so many great things after that, and really he had no right to do that. Yes. Um, so I'm kind of interested in, in you can, can you address how you initially wrote the, that story of Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright? Did you have that structure in mind? Sure, what a and, great question. Um, for everybody else who's not hearing this question, there's a lot of praise involved. I mean, we've just had several paragraphs of praise of how wonderful I am. And how great <laughs> I am. But I'll, I, won't, I won't repeat any of that. It's a question about the structure of the women, my last novel before this, which deals with the entire life and career of Frank Lloyd Wright, primarily, though, as seen through the point of view of his four women in his life, his mistress and his three wives. And it also runs backwards so that um, you begin with his last wife and go down the ladder to the death of Mama. Well, for obvious reasons, I could then end climactically with the murder of Mama Borthrop Traney. She was killed uh, with a hatchet by a, uh, a crazed uh, servant. Her two children were killed also, uh, and also several other workers, and the house was burned down. What's so interesting, as you say, is that Frank Lloyd Wright was not there that day because he was doing the Midway Gardens in Chicago and commuting back and forth, and he was trying to get this thing on the deadline and get it built. Had he been there, he well could have been killed, and there would have been nothing beyond 1914. So there's all of that. Um, also, as I discovered this structure, and of course I had a structural idea in the beginning, which, which I didn't have with this, because um, each one is different. Um, I, could, I could meditate on what love relationships are. Um, how, not me of course, but I'm sure all of you have maybe had more than one relationship in your life, um, where you're in love and it's a great thing. You want to spend every second with you, you're in a Marana and it's so great. But maybe, after a while, you pull apart and maybe it goes sour, maybe it even gets antagonistic. Um, so I was able to show, by going backwards, each of them. Like, to be, begin with, Old Gavana, the last wife, is there, and um, he's in love with her, but he's being pursued by his previous wife, wife Miriam. Miriam is this Marengo. She's a lunatic. She's horrible. Um, but then, as we go backwards, we see Miriam in a new light when he first meets her, and she's so sexy and enchanting, and, um, and that enables me to kind of play with the idea of what relationships are. And again, I'm using real material. I love the real history or the real biology. I'm just dramatizing it. So Miriam, in real life and in my telling, came to Frank Lloyd Wright after the death of Mema. She'd been murdered, Taliesin had been burned down. He got lots of sympathy uh, letters from all over the world, thousands of them, because he was pretty well known at this point. One came from Miriam Maud Noel. Uh, she was around his age, which was late 40s at that time. She was an elegant and beautiful woman, um, widowed. She'd been living in Paris for the last 10 years, but World War I drove her back to live in this miserable room in Chicago with her daughter. And um, he liked her letters so much that he agreed to meet with her on Christmas Eve in his office in Chicago, their first meeting. And she swept in wearing her sealskin coat and this beautiful hat and these boas and everything else and she had a lorgnette and a cigarette and a holder and she just talked breathlessly to him about love and passion and poetry and everything else on and on and on and he was mesmerized by her and she paused for breath and said so how do you like me and he said I've never seen anything like you <clears throat> wow that was it what a relationship I, also, I got this information from his own autobiography. You know, but what do you do with it? And how do you structure it? So each one is different and each one has its own challenges. And you're right to ask the question because in that case, I had a structural idea to begin with. So, which of the books have less of that historical aspect? I can think of maybe Drop City having less of that? I mean, or do all of them have some kind of factual base that they could drive it off? Of? The question is, which of the books have less of the history or less of factual? I, I rotate always you know, between different sorts of things just to keep myself fresh and to keep the audience fresh. So that 
novels that are just uh, of whole cloth are things like uh, East is East, set in Georgia, where there's a writer's colony, and set in Japan. Um, um, most recently, um, The Friend of the Earth. The Friend of the Earth, which precedes this, is also about environmental issues. The year 2000, about global warming, which projects into 2025. I mean, that's just comes. And so too with the stories. Some stories require some research, because I send stories anywhere. I, I have no limitations. I send a story anywhere on Earth. Um, and some are uh, just experiences. It requires nothing. Just you are inspired, you do it. Um, I'll give you an example. I read a story a few years back that The New Yorker published. It was called Swept Away. It's a very whimsical story. Um, I had read that the windiest place in the world is the Shetland Islands of Scotland. Uh, you know, kids, little kids have spun down the street, cats, flower pots, you know, it's always good to there. So what, what fun? What would that be like? So I wrote a love story. And it's about um, an American ornithologist who comes to study the birds. She's kind of pretty. She's wearing a, a little tartan skirt that she's bought at the tourist shop. She's got black leggings and she's kind of cute. She's just come off the ferry, got her backpack full of, you know, cameras and stuff, and she's walking up the main street. And behind the window of the main street are all the local slugs who live there drinking beer. And it turns out that one of them is Robbie Bakey. And he's never had a girlfriend in his life. He's never got anything. He lives on his family sheep ranch and so on. And his cat is up there trying to catch pigeons. And it's a big cat. Not like the cats we were talking about, the, the, the foxes we were talking about. This is a 14-pound cat. It's blown off by a gust. And it cracks Judy Uli right in the head, and she's knocked out unconscious on the road. And at that point, old Duncan Stower, the oldest guy on the island, is coming in his car, his ancient car, going 10 miles an hour, right for her. And Robbie Bakey runs out and saves her. And so the romance starts. All right, well, you know, this has a lot of local color, this story. Shetland Islands. So, two years later, the local magazine of the Shetland Islands, the Shetlander, asked me if they could reprint the story because it was so great. And they wondered how many years I'd lived in the Shetland Islands. <laughs> and I had to point out that I had never actually been to the Shetland Islands, but I had been to the Arctic coast of Scotland once in Oldham and nearly froze to death, and that was enough. <laughs> and the rest is invented. So I got lots of details of the islands, that, uh, right down to names of characters and so on. Um, and Faked it. That's what it's about. It's an improvisation. It's a seduction of you. I'm inviting you into this world for you to believe it. But sometimes, as with the, the details of this or with the uh, Franklin Wright book, the historical details, I love the history so much, or here the ecology, that I'm sort of instructing you in it. Um, there have been over a thousand books written about Franklin Wright. I never realized the extent of the cult of him until I read, read this book, wrote this book. Um, but if you've never read any of them and know nothing about them, you can read this novel, and it's all true. All the facts are true. But of course, I'm playing it for my own purposes and dramatizing it. You know, history is, is wonderful, but it doesn't tell you what people were thinking. You just heard Dave uh, LaJoy, for instance. You're in his head, you know? You get an idea of what he's thinking. You don't get that necessarily from history. So my um, fun in some of these books is to dramatize it. What was it like? <laughs> um, the first book I wrote on going to Santa Barbara is called Riven Rock. Um, I, felt, I figured I needed to know some of the history of the place I just moved to. Riven Rock is set at the turn of the last century, and it deals with Stanley McCormick. He was the heir to the McCormick uh, the Reaper the fortune, you know, the millionaire. He had a big 35-acre estate and so on. Um, when he was in his late 20s, he married a woman also in her late 20s, Catherine Dexter McCormick, an amazing beauty and also very, very wealthy. Um, the first female graduate in the sciences of MIT. And notwithstanding, he's very handsome, tall, handsome guy, wealthy, uh, bright thinking. Problem is, he had a mental problem, which was beginning to become apparent. He was schizophrenic. Catherine made the great mistake that many women do, thinking, well, you know, He's a little squirrely, but if I get him away from his mother, I think I can straighten him out. Catastrophically wrong. This is the most horrendous uh, marriage in history. Um, I, I, to just give one detail, they never consummated the marriage. Stanley was incapable. He became 
what was called a sexual maniac. For 20 years, he had to be locked in Riven Rock, away from everybody, because any woman he saw, he would assault immediately. Not necessarily sexually, but just assault. He was that crazed. And I think it was because having to be intimate was too much for him to stand, and it made his mental problems more full-blown. And <laughs> you really want to hear horror, and this is true. On, they were married at her chateau in, in Lake Geneva, which is now the American Embassy. And he was an early advocate of motor cars, 1905. Um, their honeymoon was a month motoring throughout France. Two other individuals came with them, his mother and her mother. How could you make this stuff up, you know? It is so fabulous. And so, to conclude all of this, I will say, people asked me about this book. They said, how do you know that the marriage was unconsummated? It's easy. I wrote the book. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.